This is part three of our series discussing Frank Zappa's final work, Civilization Phase Three. And uh, this is being recorded on December 12th, 2010. Okay, Chad, what do you have for us today? Hey, um, today uh, we're going to go through the, we're getting a lot of echo there. Okay. Today we're going to go through uh, from the first track on disc one and examine each piece and then give some commentary on it once we've heard it, just like we did in the first episode. So I'm going to lead off with the track number one on disc one. It's called This is Phase Three. So that's a good introduction to start with. And here we go. This is Phase Three. Well, get through phase one and two first. Here's phase one. The audience sits inside of a big piano and they listen to it grow. People are going to sit inside of a piano. They're going to listen to the piano go. They're going to listen to the piano grow. It's going to turn into... It's going to turn into another hate Ashbury. Remember how we commercialized on that scene? That was a really good move. Right, man. All it was was like people sitting in doorways, speaking out tourists, going, let me go around, let me go around, and they call that doing your thing. Oh, yeah. That's what doing your thing is. The thing is to put a motor in yourself. Okay. So, could you hear the words clearly? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yeah, so that yeah, was that, uh, that was his. He, they, he says, well, "Let's get through civilization phase one." So he goes, "Okay, this is civilization phase one," and then he goes into the piano growing. So I hadn't noticed that before, but I I don't know at what point he transitions into civilization phase three, or if he does. Here, let me state it clearly for the recording. So there's a character. Uh, Spider goes, this is phase three. This is also. And then John comes in and goes, well, I'll get through phase one and two first. And then Spider says, all right, all right, here's phase one. And then Zappa comes in and says, the audience sits inside of a big piano and they listen to it grow. Yeah, now that, that's definitely phase one and the piano's a sim- symbol for me of the ant phase. Remember Ant Man B, B Fart song. From your and from your chart, mean? No, that that is uh, embedded in my chart, Ant Man B. But B Fart, you know, in Trout Man's Replica had a song called Ant Man B. Ant is uh, visual space, industrial working hardware. B is electronic software, and man's in the middle, uh, trying to figure out what it is. Uh, how much of the past industrial to keep going, the ant world, and how much can you get totally free from the ant world and the bee world. So for me, the piano is a symbol of industrial space, and that's phase one. So in my system, that works. And he's talking about growing, and what happens? You end up with some stupid little place like Kate Ashbury, and then it's commercialized. The, the trend mongering that, um, who was it, Studebaker Hawk? Yeah, was that the name of the guy? The little piglet? Swifty trend mongers. Oh, yeah, um, Gregory Peckery. Yeah, Gregory Peckery. Who's Studebaker Hawk? Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, Gregory Peckery was uh, exemplary of that. And that is the endless um, subsuming uh, any cultural creativity or populist movement back into the industrial uh, vacuum cleaner. So... Um, for me, it makes total sense that phase one is the piano. And, and you know, Zappa, uh, McLuhan says bigness creates frustration. You grow the piano. You know, you spread the, uh, the abandoned, you spread the creeping meatball, the hardware thing, and which is what's happened. Because you don't, as McLuhan said, one world's dead and, power, and the new one's powerless to be born. So phase one is dead and phase three is powerless to be born. So we're trapped in between, which is the symbolism of a man in between ant and beat. Okay, that's so. Someone else say something. And uh, so Bob, do you think that the piano represents an environment? Is that what you're saying? It represents the industrial environment. McLuhan always yeah. said that the piano was visual space. You needed, you know, visual acuity, and uh, it's the it's the high left hemisphere action, uh, a skillfulness to create high definition music um, that the piano is the main instrument for of that period. 
So why would the that environment be growing? Oh, because be, when you have the, the software world goes around it, and the industrial establishment can't really lo- loosen up what they're doing. They keep kids going to school and maintain visual space values, and so the electric world is tiny and efficient. Everybody has access to the same information. This is in the 60s or so. And the industrial world's got nowhere to go but to grow cancerously. And that's, just, that's what it, it's frustrated. It's not relevant anymore. Like Bucky Fuller, you know, started complaining by late 70s that the captains of the industry were pirates and hijacked the planet. And he said, look, we can move into a totally new scarce, uh, n- no scarcity society, society starting in 1970. So all through the 70s, he's advocating that. And the industry captains have too much of an identity crisis for letting go on that level so the world spreads i mean the uh, the meatball creepy meatball of hardware nonsense spreads around the planet which is the summation of what we have the last 30 years so and that's and all collapsed that's now motor, Bob? that's the motor that's it it's a good question it's a it's it, what does it say there uh, you put a motor in yourself but no, yeah, you know what? We got uh, That's a big jump to go from what we just quoted to go to the end of that and talk about. Oh, okay, motors. but that that we got to go to there at some point. That's really important. What oh, the heck is the I motor? I got to say, Studebaker Hawk is the motor because uh, Studebaker Hawk is a superhero in Billy the Mountain and right. derived from the Studebaker uh, Silver Hawk automobile. Yeah. So okay. Yeah. Anachrony, Bob, coming in already. <clears throat> Yeah, the um, Studebaker Hawk is a detective. He's the su- he's the software world. He's a private investigator, right? But he works for the industrial FBI kind of thing, and so he's ridiculous. Um, uh, Gregory Peckery is someone also working in software, but for uh, he's not a spy. He's just a trend monger. You know, just creates finds out the latest fads and then makes some imagery around it. Tinseltown Rebellion is about that, right? Mm-hmm. So I'm looking up, Chad, your old emails to me. You sent the um, transcripts of this stuff. Uh, is what you're playing now in that original transcript, or is this is new stuff? Um, the transcripts you'll see in my email are not complete. They're only the songs that I wanted to focus on in the first session. All right. So I'll, email, I don't, I'll, I'll email you the link right now, and you'll okay. get to where I am for the full transcript, the full lyrics. Great. And yeah. you can send, you can send some to Scott too. Okay. And and James. Yeah. Okay. So uh, well, uh, I just wanted to insert before we move on from the first here. Uh, here, you know, the audience is inside listening to a piano grow. What does that evoke? The listening to a piano grow. That's, that's commercial. Speech. That's commercial radio. I mean, that's the top forty. That is an industrial marketing of music, and you're you're making visual space and all the disservices of that grow while engaging in the acoustic new world of acoustic simultaneity or pop music, electrified music. So and that's actually, what people are listening to when when they're listening to pop culture. They're actually listening to the expansion of the the environment. Yeah, the two two good points. That's a good point, Scott. Because the listening, there's your movie for your, was it movie for your uh, ears? The mixing of senses. And there's a cartoon in the Medium is a Massage where these two Wall Street guys are looking at two young mod kids, mid sixties, and they're going, they're sort of disgusted with these kids, but then they say, well, yeah, but they contributed to one third of the economy. So they're talking about the capitalization of the youth market. So the kids are listening to the Beatles and they don't know the huge money made by EMI is going in to prop up the industrial structure that leads to Vietnams and things like that. You see what I mean? They're listening to the old environment grow because it's based on profit. Yeah. Or you're still within the capitalism system. Now that, I'm saying that's what I get from it. What do you guys think it means? Forget my idea. I want to hear what what you thought it meant. Um, Well, I saw it in that they're watching the, uh, the piano grow, and that is the environment that used to be the hidden ground, which is becoming the, which become the figure. And just like once the printing press became obsolete, that's when more books were printed. 
That would be right. an example of watching an environment grow. Um, but the big insight that I got while you guys were discussing it, or while you were commenting, Bob, was that um, what people call pop culture in the time of Lumpy Gravy, which is when this text would have been read into Civilization Phase 3, um, the pop, what they called pop culture then would have been the sound of, well, the reason why they call it pop is because of that pop. You know what I mean? It's popping from something like a piece of popcorn going from a kernel to a bigger thing. And that would be that expansion, whether it's through being a frustrated old environment or what have you. But there's definitely the, the thing that they're saying is the biggest, hottest thing that's growing in pop culture. It's growing because it's obsolete. Right. And, and it also has get, it has to get big to compete with the tiny etherealized new environment that it's been confronted by. Yeah. And in, in the analog media phase, there was incredible wealth to be made because you had access to kids 24-7 through the hit, hit parade stuff. You know, it's a whole new way of, of uh, making money re- instantly. Uh, in that sense, it's a pop, a bubble. I mean, it really is. Uh, it's a neg entropy in the software world. They, yeah, they or it's a, it's, a web, it's a web 1.0 bubble, or it's a gold rush, you know? Yeah, it's yeah. a new thing that you can cap, really capitalize mm. on, and that's what they say here. Remember how we commercialized on that scene. So to me, this is showing a, a cliche process that gets repeated every time there's something, uh, something new that hits the scene, whether it's a yeah. whole new environment yeah. of rock and roll or whether yeah. it was the, the telegraph or what have you. And, and, and Zappa he has a vision to go beyond that. You know, he says, look, you know. Seize the ground. Yeah, he says, look, we can have a new situation. He also, being quadrophenic, he'll, he'll adopt the cynical position that nothing's going to change. But, but that's only for those that come up with romantic, revolutionary notions and don't even begin to know where we're, what the real factors are. So he, he's cynical about them, but he has a vision about how you could do it to have society differently. And he, he yeah. proved that by running for president, you know, way back in 68. He was uh, thinking that, um, and, well, a lot of people were thinking we could do this differently. So he is, he in the pop music field is the only Bucky Fuller among them who has a vision of why you could kill ugly radio. And if you don't, the piano will just continue to grow. And he's not even part of pop culture, really. He's not, yeah. I don't think of him as pop culture. Well, he had a couple of songs that were. Valley Girl, I mean, that created a pop subculture. And he had Don't Eat the Yellow Snow, you know, eight years before. Yeah. That was a big hit. And it, it's just, he was just, being part of pop culture is you have a hit for a few weeks, you know, and then you're, you're a flash and everybody's into it and then it's dropped. He, he experienced that. Mm-hmm. But Valley Girl went on yeah. for a while. Yeah, it did. Right. But, he, but I want to see, I noticed something else in here, the part where he goes, right, man, and it was like people sitting in doorways freaking out tourists going merry-go-round, and they call that, do, and they call that doing their thing. So it's like the way that this dynamic works, this cliche process of the expanding new obsolete environment, people have to do their thing. So they have to find out, okay, there's a new environment. What's my thing in this environment? And then they can engage in role yeah, playing. Yeah. yeah, what's so, my role? Yeah, exactly. I see it as a, uh, a micro view of everyone being a satellite composer. Stuck, that's right. Stuck in the piano. Yeah, that's what was incredible uh, in the 60s, knowing uh, McClellan stuff, which not many people knew, and hearing how Frank picked the right words, and where he says, merry-go-round, merry-go-round, and you can think of Iron go saying, the wheel goes round and round, the wheels go round and round. Yeah. Do-do-do-do, and they call that doing their thing. See, here's Zappa. He's looking at the, the freak culture, the hippie culture is happening in 667 in L.A. and San Francisco, and he's knowing that the, what the kids think is freedom is, that is it's, it's ridiculous. But he doesn't say why the kids want to do their thing. He just knows that's the new trend and makes fun of it. McClure comes in and says people want to do their thing for the very reasons you just quoted. In the satellite theater, there is no audience, so everybody becomes an actor and looks for a role and puts on a costume and a role. So you put Zappa and McClure together, you got a really good history of the 60s. Yeah. So, you know, so when Dylan said, you want to know the 60s, read McLuhan and Mailer, well, that's a literate. There's Dylan, the literate poet, pointing to those two writers. No, put McLuhan with Zappa. Then you got a real history of the yeah. 60s. 
And then in uh, looking back at a lot of his work, it's it's manipulating satire uh, based on that micro satellite satellite conductor view, where he knows everyone's a satellite conductor, but they're uh, stuck in a micro position. Or I don't know if they always satirize that. Yeah, I don't know if they're not. They're not satellite conductors. They might be able to, but you you got to be pretty smart. And yeah, James, be able what do you mean by satellite conductor, James? Well, what does that, that evoke they, for you? I'm talking about maybe the 60s with the satellite. and. Uh, but the people didn't know about the satellite effect. Yeah, yeah, but he, Zappa can see it, and he's, he, he parodies it, you know. Um, well, that's a, 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 that's. I'm going to interrupt when I feel that you said enough, and it's good. It's good enough because we can work with what you've said, not to cut you off, but know that what you just said is good because that's what you think of him having the the um, satellite silver environment in at Cucamonga, and he's inside a rocket ship mm -hmm. and he's making that movie. He's he's instinctively getting glimpses, and I don't know if he would agree with us what we're saying, but we can build a case based on what we learned from McLuhan. Mm -hmm. And how he actually accidentally, serendipitously, like Forrest Gump, produces stuff that totally fits in with the McLuhan explanation. But he probably wouldn't know the, the uh, satellite conductor theme. He just knew that he could right. have the whole. He, he could have the what whole. Do you, theme. What do you mean by satellite conductor when you use that term uh, technically, Bob? <clears throat> the position that um, the top managers in society. You know, the uh, Pentagon, the top corporations, they marketed their stuff all over the whole planet. And they didn't think of just being Americans. They had major environments. They, you know, one company might own radio stations, trucks, uh, swimming pool companies, satellite rocketry. They'd be spread all over the place. And so from the perspective of the head of General Motors or one of those things, they had a global perspective. They were floating around the planet as if they were in a satellite. Then would you and say that, that matches up to the solar theater chunk yeah. of your chart? Yeah, the solar theater. You have world solar government. Solar which, government. The, yeah, the solar government. And, and you can put the idea of solar government that definitely McLuhan understood. You can see glimpses of it in the content of Zappa's work, but you don't know whether Frank knew that, knew the big picture. But he certainly, like any artist, instinctively did it. Yeah, I, I referenced it because... He says that the thing is to put a motor in yourself. So that's my hint to to why it's a, a satellite condition. It's like everyone has okay. a motor in themselves. Okay, now that, that's okay, but uh, I would support the satellite conductor thing that he was um, onto it instinctively. His, I think it's on Uncle Meat, the main company, one of the main companies listed, that's a zap of companies called International Absurdities. Do you remember that? Mm -hmm. And that, see, that's incredible to put out international absurdities as the name of your main country, your main company. And um, McLuhan's saying, right at that time, you're in the global theater of the absurd. <laughs> They're both the same idea, almost. He's doing a homeopathic yeah. replay, Bob. Don't you think of the satellite of this of this uh, solar government? Who oh, Zappa is? Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. He's doing it uh, as a parallel to McLuhan, but. He just has perfect pitch. He's doing it right, even though, he, remember, he didn't, he heard a bit of McClellan for me and, and when he saw him on TV and he said, that guy isn't, isn't thinking right. He had no clue what McClellan was talking about. And you notice in the Bob Marsh interview, when the McClellan stuff is embedded a little bit, if it said, okay, Frank agrees with it, but he doesn't know it's McClellan stuff or what, it, what, what the implications are. But then he comes up with, the thing is to put a motor in yourself. Yeah, I don't that, get that. What is? What do you get from that thought? Put a motor in yourself. It's your cyborg. Okay, it's, it's a motor is an automobile. Okay. It's more industrial to me than than say the, the satellite it's, or the it's, rocket it's ship. It's a transfer transfer between the industrial and the android. I'd say. Right, and or you could say the electronic. The yeah. the thing is, the motor is the American archetype. Everybody is their car you know, through the 20th century. So he's pointing out the cyborgian, though he wouldn't use that word, the fact that the mechanical bride is part of you. So when the American kids 
want to do the effect, uh, respond to the effect of the satellite unconsciously and do their own thing and create their own spaces, they, they are putting it in, uh, on the user as content level. They are American, they're American versions of doing your thing is put a motor in yourself. I now can be a car. You, you right, see, there, there are two. Mo there, you, you've got two simultaneous motors going on. You've got a, a combustion, combustible combustion type motor, and then you've got the your elect your electric motor, which are be which are m beginning to merge. That's right. And the, ele the what was your first one? The industrial motor, the combustible engine. Mechanical. Right. Well, McLuhan used to say that the automobile was a combination of the mechanical, mechanical and electric. So it has both, but. You know what I mean? Just the the form itself. So, so, and that's where but you as put. We move, yeah, and as we, you know, okay, as we move more towards the hybrid, it's becoming more electric, and eventually it'll probably be totally electric. Right. So the kids represent the position in between A and B. The, this frustrated American numbskull position of being between ant and B is to put a old hardware motor in your new software performing actor role maker. You know what I mean? Yeah. Exactly. Tr trying to get on TV. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and that's what those I was telling you after the the May March seventh nineteen seventy Olympic Auditorium concert with uh, with the Hot Rats after he broke up the Mothers. And that I was at, all those kids, after the concert, when he was standing there and just leaving, they all ran up, all saying, take my motor that will allow me to get in the media. Take my, my band's name. Take this. Give me a contract. They all wanted to get into the media. You know, they all wanted to have a role in the, in the B world, electronic world. But, but they all thought... They were futile because they were industrial kids. Their archetype and noble reality was putting an industrial motor in themselves. They thought that if they got on TV, they'd, they'd have their own car. Mm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the car archetype is. Yeah. Is and that, and that's what you say is really good. Well, I mean, it's definitely part of the whole Elvis scene and everything that comes before Frank, and then uh, Frank kind of it, swallows that archetype. Right, and remember the cover of just another band from L.A. The mothers are in this old, you know, 50s car, and Zappa's got his damaged um, leg and is sticking out the window, but they're all in the car, and it's inside a hamburger. <laughs> yeah, I don't get that. So, <laughs> Oh, that, that's the fast food, but you know what it refers to? Um, one of the few times he was in Time Magazine. He was in Time Magazine in... In October, late October '69, you can look it up when he broke up the mothers. So you know, time. All right, yay! Frank stopped. You know, with no more Frank to worry about. So they give him coverage. You know, and he's standing in front of his home with Gail, and he's got the countryman farmer overalls on, and he's standing where the big fence is now, and it's uh, it's before the fence, uh, which goes up in let's say '70 70, '71. He um, he says in there he gives the script of an idea of the new movie Uncle Meat, and he talks about if I can vaguely remember it, he says all the hippies are rounded up, and he says and the mothers too, mothers invention. So he doesn't put himself in with the hippies, and they're rounded up and put on a concentration camp on the moon, and the monsters come, you know, Gorgon, what were they called? Uh, some Rodan and. King Kong and Gorgon or some monster again. Mothra, these monsters, Japanese movie monsters, he says, come and save the, the uh, hippies in the concentration camp just in time. And then they find out that the concentration camp was run by a little puppet in the glove compartment of a uh, Volkswagen bus. And that little man was like a Colonel Sanders kind of man. So there, there's your Kentucky Fried Chicken, your hamburger kind of staple of kids on the road, mm -hmm. uh, that kind of fast food. That's what run it. And now that comes back perfectly. That's the old piano, crap economy, that benefits from the concentration camp caused by acoustic space, which is mm -hmm. music. So I'm looking at the cover of just another band from L.A., and they're in a a, a, a red truck. Um, it's a cool looking car, uh, and it's the truck is on top of a uh, hamburger. 
which kind of yeah. reminds me of the Bob Big Bob's Big Boy Drive-In kind of thing. Yeah, the Happy Days kind of movie where, where they're trying to retrieve that uh, skate people on roller skates driving into the hamburger joint, you know, kind yeah. of fifties thing. So that's what I get from it. Now, if you look, if you see these kids getting the uh, CDs in the 80s and 90s, they did not see the real covers with all the neat little embeds on them. It, they were shrunk down and maybe streamlined. On the original cover, there was a little asterisk. It might have even been part of the snat. This, it, Zappa has his toes doing a snat, which is Reuben and the Jet snapping their fingers. You'd see the yeah. word S-N-A-T. And there's a snat. I'm not sure. There, there's an maybe there's nothing in the picture that's an asterisk. But underneath, no, there's there, a, there's underneath between his toes and the word snat, there's a a little star or an asterisk. Oh, good. That's what I remember. It's amazing what one remembers about this because, of course, that goes down to the note at the bottom. And can you read that, Scott, about the conceptual continuity? No, I don't see a note at the bottom on the co- on the CD al- uh, cover album here. Oh, okay. Yeah, there is a note on the album where he says. Can you something like can you identify the five clues here to the conceptual continuity? You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. He's pointing out that there's something c- continuous. Now he would say he was a conceptual continuity, but within the the movies and projects he was doing, there was an overlap. And I'm saying that the Uncle Meat scenario that he gives in Time Magazine, which never you never saw that. I don't know if it ever got filmed or anything, but he is referring to the uh, car and the hamburger, and you know that is symbolized by the little Colonel Sanders kind of guy that's in the glove. <laughs> See, this is the point. A little robot, a little a little cyborg, a little apparatus is running the global theater. That's his point. He's, he's going beyond uh, the, the Bilderbergers and the Trilateral Commission and saying it's run by a little uh, mannequin. Yeah. There's also, it looks like, on inside the car, a big milkshake. Um, and there's a guitar... Uh, through the roof, pe- penetrating through the roof, <laughs> and uh, I'm looking at a magnifying glass. There's something at the very bottom here. Some little type. It's text. It says, "Any visual similarity between the cover of this this is a album con- yeah, yeah, and the Uncle Meat <laughs> illustrated booklet, <laughs> not to mention Return to the." <laughs> T E T A or something T E T E uh, is thoroughly intentional and contains four secret clues. Yeah, that's what you were talking about. Yeah, yeah. Oh, Reuben and the Jets. Okay, so to reread that, any visual similarity between the cover of this album and the Uncle Meat illustrated booklet, not to mention Reuben and the Jets, is thoroughly intentional and contains four secret clues. Right. So it, he's showing uh, aspects of this movie script laid out in uh, in Time Magazine and referred to it in the booklet of, for Uncle Meat where he lays out the movie, uh, where Room the Jets. And that leads to, at the bottom, do you know this stuff, James? Do you, have you read these little stories and things? Yeah, um, probably about 10 years ago. You're fading out, James. Sorry, uh, probably about 10 years ago I read them. Yeah, and, and it ends with... Um, Uncle Meat pulls something out of the ground, or they go out in the desert, and there's some big apparatus there, and then he puts, he pulls the socket out of something, or he puts something in, and you get that big hum. It might even be the word dynamo hum. It's really interesting, which he popularizes a few years later in another context. It's really neat how he redoes themes and hints at what he's doing before, and it's nebulous whether there's a direct connection, but he puts the hints of it in there, which to me is the the left hemisphere linear narrative. He's only going to give hints of it like in Finning Its Wake because you can't have a total narrative in tactile conditions. He just hints at potentially there could be a story here. And, uh, mm-hmm. and he's showing the effort to do that by saying it's purely intentional. So when he says it's all one album, he used to say that all his works are one album, uh, one big album. It's also one big movie. Or one big TV talk show. Though that would be... Or that one would be big cartoon. Yeah, one big cartoon, any major analog medium. Uh, okay, so um, 
So, Chad, have you ever known you're the next generation or so? Do you do you know this stuff? Did you read these things? Off the covers, no, um, because uh, I was in the phase where you're just downloading MP3s and stuff like that. <laughs> oh, uh, no visuals. <laughs> Well, you get. I could go on and search for JPEGs of the album covers, but they don't have that level of detail where you can read the fine print. Um, so that's, nor would this, I be. Nor would I be noticing it when I was downloading ten albums at a time. You know. Right. So this is all new for you. What we're saying. Totally. Is it interesting? Oh, it's very interesting. Uh, I bought the. Um, was it the Hot Rats video? The DVD. And it came with all these materials in it, like really cool folders that it looks like a CIA brief. And there was like a pair of, um, look like 3D glasses, but it had a big nose on it. And there was well, all this, was... like fun stuff inside of the album. And I thought, wow, I wonder what it would have been, what he would have had in his albums back in the day. Cause I'm he sure didn't he didn't he didn't have that, but you could order or you could write away the United Mutations and maybe for 6768 you might get a bunch of, you get a map of the free hot spots in L.A. And, if, and a form to fill out to be a member of the United Mutations, things like that. I, I don't know if what, what much other stuff you could get unless you were in L.A. and went up to the office or something, you know, it's, it's I don't know some, some of that stuff. But, you know, the, the glasses you're talking about, that came out with uh, Broadway the Hard Way in, in 1988. So they might have threw that stuff back in, just gave you a package of stuff. So the, these new packages I don't know about because I didn't order that stuff. Okay. No, but so anyway, my point was I, I, when I saw what was put into releasing a piece of material, I figured that that was consistent with his... Um, release policy where maybe he wouldn't have extra things inside of it, but he would go to length to create some kind of, uh, I don't know, puzzles or extra multimedia aspects of the cover, things like that. I, I remember that in um, in the late 60s a little bit with United Mutations, but I don't remember any of that stuff happening in 69, 70, 71, 72. Uh, you just got the albums. It just maybe it was a different economy or different team, but yeah, he offered them, and maybe Gail, you know, in the last ten years was offering uh, the latest little doodads they had, you know. Yeah, because I also bought the Yellow Shark CD, and there were there was a whole booklet in there, and there was a, there was just a lot of stuff packed into it. So when I did buy anything from Zappa, it was always chock full. Yeah, yeah. And that, that's good, um, but what what is interesting is what he laid out in the first few albums, and uh, what he was saying in interviews um, about different movies he was making. It was all very uh, well orchestrated, like a Tetra manager. He was he was mold, like a satellite conductor, molding all kinds of media, not just you know trying all kinds of different devices and quirky things to. Uh, to get attention and to show the multi-marketing, which goes back to DOFA, the last thing we did, and the whole marketing of T-shirts and all that. You know what I mean? He uh, he comments on that. What's that called? Bling and um, T-shirt stuff. I don't know, just the the extras. Well, on this album, just uh, another uh, band from L.A., <clears throat> you open it up, <clears throat> on the inside, he's marketing Billy the Mountain. There's a picture of a guy collapsed in, on, in front of his, on his desk um, <laughs> with a storyboard in front of him and a bunch of artist materials and things, and it says, Shankel, referring to Car Car Cal Shankel, collapses in debris during preparation of the storyboard for Billy the Mountain, Clay model of roving monolith visible near left elbow. Studebaker Hawk and his train flies appear over Shankle's head and to the right. It's too bad you can't really see his Pennsylvania ashtray there. And then it says, fraudulently reenacted situation photographed by Cal Shankle with one of those little take-your-own-picture dealies. <laughs> He's like, a, is like um, he used to say he liked cheap you know, B-grade monster movies in the 50s because you could see the strings and you could yeah. see the apparatus, you know, uh, around the, the the movie. He liked to show that, and that would be what McClune called showing the ground, showing the materials that go into the uh, fantasy content. 
You know, that, that's a, that is a manipulating thing to show the props. And so that's what he's doing there. And, right. you know, that's riddled all the way through fitting his wake and other manipulating satires. Mm-hmm. There's no way Zappa knew anything about manipulating satire, even the term, and yet he is a perfect exemplar of it in, uh, in his era. He did. He followed it, really, you know, by the rules. He did everything the way a manipulian would do it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but around this period of time, probably they were already beginning to use the technique in television where um, you would... Uh, how do they do that when... Um, all of a sudden, you real they they make you aware of the fact that you're watching television by putting a television in the television or something like that, or or showing you the uh, um, equipment that's uh, actually being used to make the make the TV yeah. show happen. I See, mean, that, like, that's part, that's to, that's a staple for like the Tonight Show and like that. They always start by showing you. You see the audience, and then you see the uh, the stage in front. And you see the guys, the cameramen, and everybody, and the crew and the staff is all getting ready to go. And of course, uh, uh, Howard Stern took that to you know turn that into a higher art form by chewing out his engineers on the radio and tell them you know telling them you know, directing all his engineers and his staff on the air and, you know, calling them all assholes and telling them they were fuck-ups and everything. Okay. This is where, you know, the movie and the book and those eras are slick. You create a fantasy world for the, for the audience. You don't tell them what's going on behind the scenes. When television comes in and Marshall starts, McLuhan starts writing about this in 50, 51 right away, said that high, glossy, queen-for-a-day movie reality was now going to be toppled with the informal nature of the TV studio. And so it became natural not to have a sleek, hide, hide all the imperfections in television because they couldn't be <laughs> that way just because the camera had to move around and was so portable and, and what was that called? Cheapness. It was kind of a cheap environment, early TV. And so the people, as they grow up on TV, don't think of that kind of manipulating set. They don't think of Manipulating satire applied to movies and, and uh, books, which would create a transparency about how the art form movie or book is made. You are already being transparent, so there's no context for breaking it. And so that requires a different kind of manipulating satire. <laughs> and what McLuhan did, he got so absurd, he made books. <laughs> he went back to an old medium. Now, that's real manipulating. Well, he's a to... professor, though. I mean, that's what professors do. No, no well, it's what they he could do, but, but his books were, did not meet any of the literary standards. When Medium and Massage came out in 67, it reviewed in Time magazine, and they said, this is the world's first non-book. They thought it was a non-book. Yeah. Okay, so... Since we're so talking you, about the early days of television, I think it's probably worth uh, a, 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 a bit of attention on the fact that the early early TV was um, live broadcast. Yeah. And, and how that was, how that, the power of that broadcasting, uh, uh, you know, uh, remember Rupert Sheldrake did this thing where he was trying to set up an experiment to measure the effects of the morphogenetic field around uh, a, a live events that were being covered and broadcast out into the public uh, consciousness. Um, and uh, I think there's probably something to that. There is a, 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 a was a pow- an electrical aliveness, everyone being focused simultaneously on an event that was actually occurring in real time, as opposed to when they started taping, filming and taping, and then uh, time shifting the shows. Um, and to different markets uh, at different time zones and like that. <clears throat> okay, so the, McLuhan's main point that television brought in a uh, a casualness and informality that came in in all levels of life in the pop culture of the 50s, 60s, and in the social life and in working life. That's the point. The high definition of movies and books and radio was flipped by the low definition, participatory, casual nature and amateurish and informal nature of the TV effect because television was made like that. See, and so a Johnny Carson who'd be a nobody in the movie era was uh, nice and casual and looked like everybody. 
a bland guy uh, could make it. So those factors um, are what is the McLuhan view of this. Now Zappa, he is a bit old fashioned. He's being the old individualist exposing the rules of the movie in Gutenberg Galaxy. He doesn't know the TV is making it casual. There's another, there's an aspect here where he's old fashioned. He doesn't see McClune stuff, and why should he? You'd have to be an extra genius to get McClune back then. Unless you're, see, the only people who understood McClune were executives of big environments, you know, the Tetra managers, because they had to deal with this. They recognized they used to run movies, now they ran TV. Totally different thing. And just the experience of working in that environment, making product for it, you learn the new effects immediately. But the citizen didn't know that, and Zappa didn't do, do that. And so Zappa is the retread, retread of the uh, original genius artist of the Gutenberg Galaxy phase. And he's a manipian. He's an old-fashioned Manipian, so that, that's maybe what we could do. He, he's a Manipian for the old movie and radio, movie and book world. Is he a Manipian for the digital world? That's, that's a big topic. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> you get what I'm saying? But how contrast him yeah. with uh, uh, Dil, Bob Dylan, who was also, who, whose career was being launched in, under the satellite uh, conditions? Okay, I talked about on cash flow or something, about Like a Rolling Stone. Oh, I think I bring it up in the little excerpt that I played from Melting Titanium. Um, the, that was the first record where the singer stops and starts laughing and they kind of start over again. Okay? Yeah. So that informality, see, there, that's a perfect expression. People have had this informality for 10 years or more under TV conditions. So Dylan instinctively, who knows how consciously, takes it into the polished record world and does the faux pas of making a mistake and keeps it in there. That's an example of taking the shock of going into an informal culture, which TV already did 10 years before, putting it into the industrial piano growing world of making records and making it, and it seems amazing to people. Wow, he, that's informal, that's casualness. See, do you see how it illustrates my point? It's an old architect. He makes a, you know, it's pop culture's lagging in, in some levels, um, not in what people actually do, but if you bring in literary values and say, okay, who's more avant-garde in the pop culture than someone else? Didn't, didn't appear to be a little avant-garde because he, he was the first to, to accidentally do the casual effect. And that was startling to people and made him unique. But anyways... <laughs> I don't want to keep going. If, uh, yeah, let's, you, let's you guys say to, something. Uh, let's get back to what phase one and two could be. And well, I'm interested in Chad. Thing. Chad, I'm interested in your guys. You and you and Chad know the zap of words. What we're taking, put it into that, or come up with another angle on it. Put what I said into it, or bring your own ideas into this. I was going to say, when you talked about um, possibly the Manipian satirist for the digital, I would say, well, that might be a stretch. I think to be Manipian fatic for the actual um, guts of the medium of digital would be when they started to bring in like 8-bit, blippy kind of glitchy noise into music. Uh, Zappa? But, no, not Zappa. I, Zappa didn't really do that as far as I know. Okay, here's, here's, here's a definition of manipulating satire in the digital era, which is the Android meme. It is news as the ground, and advertising is a manipulating satire of news, or the information overhauled society. Advertising becomes a manipulating satirist. In the Android meme phase, no particular individual can even be an artist of, of some significance. Like Zappa is the last artist for the last manipulating satirist for the analog phase. He could not be a satirist in the Android meme phase, and that's partly what you see in Ben's Ben Watson's biography. There is a whole contingent that thinks that late seventies, early eighties Zappa is Zappa going corporate with big guitars and big big uh, program musicians. You know that it's like he gave up trying to be a satirist. He just wanted to make excellence. He did keep going, and what he did, he. Okay, you bring in the McLuhan idea that the only thing that can serve as an anti-environment, 
or tra- see through what's going on is a rapid series of innovations. And McClellan says that's just an airsats or fake or failed anti-environment. You can't be an anti-environment in the Android meme. But Zappa certainly offered a rapid series of innovations, exploring any medium available. Uh, it was a valiant attempt by the, by the chemical body to uh, provide some kind of anti-environment. And he did do it for the chemical body mind. I mean, for most people... What he did wasn't even perceived, but they knew he was doing something. If they were half intelligent, they knew he was doing something satirical, and, and kind of he stood out, right? Mm. Well, Somehow he managed mean. to maintain a, 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 a sobriety while everyone else was getting yeah. on the media, stoned and hypnotized, mm-hmm. and uh, everybody must get stoned. Zappa seemed to have this, like, uh, he was, like, sober, and he was uh, going to, um, I don't know what drug he was taking, that kept him sober, but um, <clears throat> from that uh, detached place, he could then, you know, he he was the he was the best social, rep- social criticism and and make fun of all the childishness that he saw going on around him. Yeah, but the the, the way he was able, to, the important part was that because he had an income and had a role in the mute rock music industry. That got him on TV and got him to do the Johnny Carson interview. That's where you're significant. When you can go from your little audience and go into the major media and be on TV and do interviews, that's, that's communication. You're crossing boundaries. And also to make movies and all the other things he did, TV specials. It's, the, it's, the, it's his availability and to form uniquely in any available medium, which is the definition in... In Wally's book, Dave Wally's book, there's a definition, and it might be uh, from the conceptual continuity flyer that he put out in 71, it's called Hey Snazzy Executives. He says, we take any available, something like we take any available medium, if you Google this, Chad, you'll probably be able to find it, and we take any available medium, energy and God. See if you can find that quote. That's, and he lays that out real early, and that's what he manages to do in the 70s and 80s. He shows up everywhere. Well, All he, the was same. A, he was as good of a businessman as he was an artist. Yeah. I mean, I'd heard people criticize, and I think it's probably true, that where Jimi Hendrix and Janis Joplin and Jim Morrison failed was they were so absorbed in being an artist that they let everybody else take care of the, the, the business and all the rest of it. They, had no, they paid no attention to it, which is what kept uh, um, that Zappa grounded. That's he was a, that's such a good businessman that he was able to create an industry around his own his own self as an artist. That's what you mean by he had a level of sobriety. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. I agree. Um, so, okay, so here's the thing. The Android meme 6090, he's the, he's the last surviving chemical body artist making a valiant attempt to, uh, you know, make the chemical body sort of perceptually relevant as the... Uh, more than the piano grew, you got the all media complex grew then in the 70s and 80s. But what's interesting, when the Android meme dies in 90, and then you've got the after image of the Android meme with the growth of the internet, Zappa does not make it. He dies. Mm-hmm. He, he, he's not relevant to the post Android meme phase where everybody becomes a satellite conductor with their digital web 1.0 and then web 2.0. And they can all be manipulated satirists as well. Yeah. And it's all obsolete. It's a post-information society. Yeah. Now, Bob, I couldn't find that quote. Okay, it's, I guess it's not out there. Um, well, I'm, I might find it in a few minutes. So don't worry about it. It's, it's basically, he says, we take, I take every available medium. It's, it's interesting what he links together. Every available medium, energy, and God. <laughs> He's going to subsume God, which is him intuiting the Android meme virtual reality, swallowing up all those chemical body archetypes. See, he's actually, mm. he, he, he's the best Android meme in any environment because he's pretty close to, to uh, knowing what he's up against. You know, Ben Watson in his post epilogue, whatever they call it, the post, was a pro epilogue. He does an epilogue, a new one for the, uh, re- the paperbackization of... Uh, Negative dialects is a poodle play, and he discusses Frank as a virtual composer. He doesn't do it in the book when it came out in '93 or so, but he does update that, and that's a good essay. At least he's noticing. And virtual reality had become a you know a buzzword by 
94, 95 when he wrote that. Uh, so he, he, he takes on Frank being a virtual reality composer. Yeah, I guess, uh, you know, uh, he could have been, you know, he was uh, always ahead of the curve. I guess when everybody else had the opportunity to become a satellite composer, as it were, then at best he could be a mascot for what everybody else was beginning to be able to do for themselves. That's right. He is a mascot. He's a, he's a souvenir of uh, a guy who did it when it was very hard to do. And so he's an he's a inspirational logo, right, a model for young kids as they might think they require a chemical body uh, reference point. Yeah, you know, now that I think about it, what he did was probably more difficult than being the President of the United States. Yeah. To become the President of the United <laughs> States, you just sort of have to learn the rules of the game and how to, uh, you know, you have to be a good businessman, a good lawyer, a good politician, you have to be all these things, but Frank, invent, you know, he invented, what he did was he invented... How to live. Yeah. Without being, without ending up being the president, who is that little Colonel Sanders popper in the glove compartment, mm. popper, little puppet, Colonel Sanders puppet in the glove compartment of a Volkswagen bus. Now you notice the Volkswagen bus was the, uh, the typical vehicle for the hippie culture, and he's saying that this little robot is in the hippie's own vehicle. It's it's infiltrated inside, all around the theme. Who are the brain police? And he develops that later into um, the Joe's Garage, has a lot of update of that with Sid Cyborg or whatever, whatever that thing was called. I mean, a lot of the themes are in there. So the but thing is, is want, one of the things that strikes me about Frank is he did not want to eat other people's shit. <laughs> a politician, including the President of the United States, has got to eat a lot of shit to yeah, get around. Yeah. And Frank wouldn't do that. He's like the guy out in the wilderness, the lonely, uh, you know, individualist, rugged individualist out in the log cabin that when you know, they have these kind of characters in Hollywood all the time, you know, the, and the citizens struggle along and they end up near the guy and he just takes pot shots at them. Like, Get the hell off my property. I own this whole mountain. You know what I mean? <laughs> that's, it. that's really what... So I'm not lining up for four hours to get my driver's license. Fuck. Yeah, that's what he said. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, uh, okay, so that image. Some people, as the as the baby boomer generation got tribalized, and even Generation X, they found his rugged individualism old fashioned. Some of the reviewers, you know, yeah, they yeah, they, yeah. they knew they could, why be like that. They had to deal with frats and, and co-ed dorm life and all that mixture where there was hardly any difference between men and women, and they didn't even have any private identity. Zappa would eventually, by the age of 90, seen as to be a crank philosopher. A crank was the insult. <laughs> and I think that's how Time Magazine described him in the, in the tradition of Harry Parch and, the, I don't know, Conlon and Ann Carroll and people like that who were eccentric composers. They were the cranked, individualist, grash, grash tinkerer kind of composer. You know what I mean? But that's mm -hmm. Time Magazine, keeping it to the limitations of the magazine medium. Zappa, when you really appreciate it, he was way beyond them. He's beyond those categories. Like Scott said, mm -hmm. it was heroic what he, what he, how he kept up with as much as possible, the Android meme. Well, he, provi he provided some stable ground for people like me to, to work off. Yeah, he, few, you know? he, he provided a whole landscape that impressed you, hypnotized you into say, wow, this is someone who has got something I don't have. He's a good role model to see what I can develop in myself because he was so beyond yeah, you, absolutely. right? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. As a, as a teenager, I mean, it's like the ultimate role model. Yeah, yeah. And it, the, it was hard for me wow. to get used to. I, I did. Well, as a young, uh, you know, in my younger years, I never, I never really got into the Zappa bubble until I met you, Bob, but I think that I did, was offended by his, uh, uh... He wasn't your kind of role model. His, his humor and like that. It took me a while to get used... I had to, I had to, it took me a while to get used to not, to finding humor in what I initially found to be really offensive. Yeah, because you, you, he was not your kind of role model. You were an average American in the, in the 
the general mold of values, and Frank went too beyond the American values. So uh, I'm interested, James, did you go through a phase of any kind of like feeling offended, you know, that Frank offended you uh, morally or right. sexually on any level, right. or did you always find that that was kind of a kick or funny or something? It was it was more reinforcement for how I felt. It was like, oh, oh here's someone else who he sort of yeah, shares the same feelings as me, although his were more advanced and refined. But yeah, you, know, you were just a headbanger out there in Australia. <laughs> well, you know, yeah, this, it's probably a longer story than that. But um, my brother was older than me, and he was right into the latest and greatest. And he came home in '93 one day with a thousand CDs. And, uh, yeah, that just basically blew up in the door. And they were all great stuff, you know, stuff from the 60s, 70s, and 80s, you know, prog rock, jazz, you know, a lot of Zappa, some classical stuff. So I really got honed in. And, How old were you then? Uh, uh, 12. Yeah. 12, you're, um, you're like Dave. If you listen to Dave Newfield interview, remember this guy dumped all these records on him when he was like eight years yeah, old or yeah. ten years old. You're like that. Your yeah. your 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 brother brought home this treasure trove of audio acoustic space, yeah. very and, young. And, and he he'd wake me up at you know four in the morning. You know when he, whenever he'd find you know a new cool bit or you know check out this time change or whatever, <laughs> he'd wake me up and I'd ha happily walk down and you know check it out. You know so that, that would happen. Most nice. And so you didn't so have nice. that's not a normal upbringing, you know. That's, that's no, a bit no. different. Yeah, I was, I was, and um, I was always like that when I was younger as well. You know, sort of. It, I wouldn't like to say ahead, but I was, you know, I was, I was pretty. You were the crazy. leading edge, like Newfell, of the consumption ethos of your generation. Uh. Or anti-consumption, yeah, but yeah, sure. No, yeah, no, you're consuming all this stuff. This is an example of the piano growing. All this stuff th because you 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 like the industrial, the anti-industrial values it had, the anti-work, the anti-job, yeah. whatever. The bohemian. You're consuming. Yeah. You're consuming the idea. You're hypnotized by the content and have no clue that you're reinforcing what you think you're against. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. You're helping the piano grow. By <laughs> exactly. Yeah. By it listening, mm. by listening to it, you listen to the you listen to hyper listen yeah. to the piano grow. But there's also, um, I, I guess, a, a macro view that I, I I've always had of of you know what Iron would talk about um, as you know just not knowing you know so that played off you know they play off each other you know when you specialize sometimes and listen to the zapper treats and you know try to really figure it out you know and then. That, that, can, that can get micro, but you can still get a macro effect off it. Yeah, you're saying that mystical part of yourself or the something part of yourself, the God particle that was looking for knowing or wanted reinforced, he was the role model to give you a, a hint, a feeling of knowing, yes. a big, no, big knowing. Yes. Well, yeah, I, I guess so, but I wasn't necessarily trapped inside the piano at all times. <laughs> no, 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 just your activity. You didn't know it. Your activity of keeping up on your brother who brings home a thousand things that had to be bought and somebody made money off those CDs uh, and then the content is reinforcing your sense of not being part of the industry. You didn't know that that consumption is, is, um, feeds into the American economy and really grew it. Yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs>